Paul Stanley is one of the single most recognizable front men in the history of rock and roll. Yeah. <laughs> As a, <laughs> <woo -hoo! laughs> As chief songwriter and driving force behind KISS, he's been a visionary and trendsetter since the early 1970s. He's also performed the title role of the Phantom in the Phantom of the Opera and was chosen to be the final Phantom in the 10-year run of the Toronto production. During his time in Toronto, Paul became spokesman for the Canadian-based About Face organization, which deals with children with facial differences and its impact on them. In this role, he met and spoke with both parents and children about his own personal experience with the birth defect known as microtia, which is a deformity of the outer ear and additional loss of hearing on his right side. Paul Stanley is here tonight with his memoir, Face the Music, the shockingly funny, smart, inspirational story of the incredible highs and equally incredible lows in his life, both inside and outside of KISS. He appears in conversation with San Francisco Chronicle pop music critic, Ideen Vaziri. Please welcome them both to the JCCSF. can hear me, right? Yes. I just got to thank everybody for coming down, and I got to thank everybody. It's the second week the book is on the New York Times bestseller list. Yes. And <laughs> and I really wrote the book. I wrote it for my kids, and I wrote it for you. I hope you get something out of it. It meant a lot to me, and now I'm going to sit down, and we're going to converse. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations on the uh, number two uh, Thank you. placement. Thank was you. Was that something you were thinking about when you wrote this book, that you were going to be a New York Times I never thought of that. Um, I never wanted to write a book at all. I, I think that most of the autobiographies that come out are pretty much trash. I mean, most of the, the books that people write, especially entertainers, they tend to be kind of like um, love letters to yourself. It's people writing things that are kind of doubtful, may have happened, may not have happened, may be worth commending them for or not. So um, unless a book about somebody's life has something to offer, then I don't see any purpose in writing it. So um, once I started thinking about it, I thought, I want to leave my kids something so that they understand what I went through and what it takes to succeed, not in music, but in life. Um, so I started writing the book. I never wanted to write a book that was a kiss book. I wanted to write my story. And uh, I just found in life, as I got older, that the most you get out of life is when you give the most. And, and when you open up and tell people what's going on in you, they find out that you're not much different than they are. And maybe if that's inspiring, great. We all need, we all need to be inspired. Did, did you read the other Kiss books? Because there are so many out there. And were there, did you go into writing this book with the intention of Clearing up anything or... I'm not a big fan of fiction, you know, so... <laughs> um, honestly, uh, there was no sense of, oh, I'm going to write the tell-all, I'm going to write the ultimate, you know, um, honest version of what happened, although that's what it is. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I was writing a book about myself, and there's, there's, there's no separating me from the band, so... It's a kiss book in that sense, but um, it's so much more. That's what, what I love so much about the book so far is, is the response it's gotten from people who aren't necessarily kiss fans. You know, I, I think it's a book that somebody can read and go, that's me. You know, people, people struggle with all kinds of uh, difficulties, learning difficulties, um, not looking like other people. And um, what do you do? You know, how do you, how do you deal with it? You know, I grew up being taunted. I grew up uh, 
being made fun of and uh, my family wasn't that supportive. And um, interestingly, I thought, because I love music, I said, I'm gonna become famous and then life's gonna be great. I was really fortunate that you people made, made my dreams come true. Yeah. And with everything that you did, suddenly I realized I was still personally pretty miserable. You know, I, I was so grateful for what I had, but it didn't change my life any. Um, you can hide secrets, you can hide what's going on inside you from the people around you, but you can never hide it from yourself. So at that point, like a lot of people, you either put a needle in your arm, a shotgun in your mouth, or you stop being a victim and you, 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 know, you get your shit together. Yeah. And um, my, my journey has been to have a great life. And, and what I found was, you know, you get nothing like this. You know, you have to open your hand. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was eye-opening for me to, to live the life I've lived. Somebody said to me, oh, was it like cathartic to write the book? I said, no, it was cathartic to live the life, you know. <laughs> I, you, the, I think the most surprising aspect of the book when I started reading it was realizing how difficult you had it right from the beginning and how much of an outsider you were as a child because if someone looks at the story of Kiss, it's very successful, it's all straight up. And, um, but you had a very rough start. Yeah, but um, you know, I try to tell people that your success and what you make of your life is totally up to you. The people who tell you what's impossible are always the people who failed. And um, if you innately have a sense of what you're capable of doing, then you should be able to do it. Um, don't fool yourself. If I had decided I'm gonna become a great mathematician, I would be probably flipping burgers. Because uh, you, know, you, you have to know your limitations and you also have to know what you're capable of. But once you, once you identify something that's a passion to you and that you love doing and that you're good at, the only thing that separates you from success is hard work. Hard work never killed anybody. That's right. You were, um, for those who haven't read the book, you were born with an ear deformity and you could mm -hmm. not hear out of your right ear. Um, how did that affect you early on? Well, you know, the, the, the tough part is to be different when you're a child. You can choose to be different when you get older. But when you're a child, you have no say in it. Um, kids can be cruel, but it, surprisingly, adults can objectify you. People can look at you and forget there's a human being there and kind of look, look at you as a specimen. Um, and there's no getting away from that. So it's kind of relentless. It's, it's incredibly draining. And you have this sense that you can never, never get away from it. If you put on a shirt or if you put on a dress, I'm not talking to the guys wearing the dresses. I'm talking. Um, <laughs> But if you put on something that you find out is embarrassing or people are staring at, you go home and change your clothes. When you have a facial difference, when you have a deformity, you don't get to change it. it it's something you have to live with. And uh, it's, it's never easy. And what can make it harder is, you know, sometimes parents want to give you what they think is tough love. I don't think that that's tough love. It's just, it, it's just a misunderstanding of what a child needs. If you tell a child that they're just like everybody else and they're not, well, how many times are they going to confide in you? You know, um, if somebody says to you, you're, you're, you're just like everyone else, and you go, Mom, I'm, I'm not like everybody else. And uh, so, you know, I, I tried to speak to a lot of parents and said, listen, you know, the, the, most, the most refreshing thing and, and embracing thing you can say to your kids is the same thing that I've been saying to, to kids when I meet them is, uh, you're not like everybody else, and life's going to be more difficult for you. But if you're willing to work hard, you can, you can win. You can come out on top. So um, I, I think it's, it's important for parents to acknowledge what's going on. Yeah, you can get you know, the kid who, who, who's got a limp to win the race, but you leave out the, the emotional component. And that's, I mean, that's so important to who we are is connecting our hearts and our heads. Your, your parents weren't that supportive in other aspects of your life as well. Did you feel like you had something to prove to them? Yeah, and, and what's interesting is, 
I think that never leaves us. I think even as adults, you know, I would find myself trying to get, you know, trying to get acknowledgement from my parents. I think we're always kids when it comes to our parents. When you see your parents, you want that acknowledgement. I remember when I did Phantom of the Opera, I had this sense, ah, now they think I'm legit, you know. <laughs> yeah. You know, our crazy son's not on stage in a pair of tights beating off a guitar. Um, <laughs> If you can say beating off a guitar a lot more tonight, <laughs> I think we found the answer. Um, so your parents aren't that supportive. You have this uh, pretty drastic physical uh, difference, and you see the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show. What happens to you in that moment? It was a, a epiphany. It was like this revelation. Um, Look, I'm, a, I'm a, a little fat kid who's deaf on one side, has a deformity, and um, I see this band, and I loved music from the time I was little, and I see this band on Ed Sullivan, and I just went, I can do that. I may not be able to be them, but I can touch that nerve. Now, what's that based on? It's just based on a, a gut feeling. And I think that when we're young, we have a very clear idea of what we're capable of. And as we get a little older, adults beat it out of us. You know, we have, we have an innate sense of what's possible until somebody tells us it, it's impossible. And the people who tell you what's impossible are the ones who failed. So misery loves company. So a lot of times people don't champion you and tell you, yeah, that's possible. So, I mean, that being said, I wasn't initially very, very talented or gifted. It, my parents couldn't afford to send us, uh, my sister and I both to music school at the same time. So they sent my sister for mandolin lessons and then they took her out of this school and sent me there for guitar. Um, I didn't realize there was different styles of guitar. It was classical guitar, but in any case, I was there for about a month and the, the teacher said to me, tell your parents we'll take your sister back for free if you quit. So, <laughs> So there's another part to that because you saw the Beatles and then you realize that, hey, I can, I can do this with my life. And then you saw Led Zeppelin and Robert Plant, was it in 1969? 69, yeah. And then that was, the, the puzzle really started yeah, coming together. Yeah, um, I was a huge <clears throat> Anglophile. I loved all the British bands. Um, wasn't a big fan of um, most of the bands that came out of this area. And neither are you. Um, <laughs> Um, so, you know, I, I, I was fortunate. I could go to the Fillmore East. You had the Fillmore here in Winterland. So on any given weekend, for three, four, and five dollars, you could see Humble Pie, Derek and the Dominoes, and somebody else, or you could see Jimi Hendrix, um, Sly and the Family Stone. It was always three-act bills and great eclectic groups of, of, of musicians and music. So that was like church to me, was going to see the Yardbirds with Jimmy Page. All, all the, you know, while other kids were doing God knows what, I was just making a pilgrimage downtown. So, and when I saw Zeppelin, it was for less than 2,000 people, but um, it was so palpable what they were doing. The energy and the focus, the sexuality, the musicianship, everything was just so perfect that it was, um, it was awe-inspiring and humbling at the same time. When I left, I said to my friend, let's not even talk about this because anything we say will minimize what we just saw. I mean, it was, it was so incredible. It, ra it, it raised a bar and set a bar for me that I said, I'll never reach that bar, but work towards that. You know, know that that's possible. Maybe not for me, but, you know, Zeppelin, uh, I mean, Jimmy Page is, is, it, is it. I mean, he's... So you had that bar, but you did something quite remarkable, which is you transformed yourself into um, not just a rock star, but this comic book hero, this icon, this superhero, really. You, 
you became this superhuman character. Um, when you first put on the, the star on your eye and the makeup, did you know that you were going to transcend just a mere, you know, the Robert Plant type? A mere Robert Plant type? <laughs> well, <you know. laughs> I'm still trying yeah, to transcend. Those guys are walking around Robert, Robert all over the place. Yeah. Um, we always wanted to be more than what we had seen. We wanted to be the band we never saw. Um, it just came about very naturally, the, this evolution. And um, interesting that, that the, the painfully shy kid, uh, the introverted kid whose social skills were like next to none, created this character. And it was really interesting because when we first started playing in clubs, everybody would talk on stage. And it, it, it was embarrassing. I mean, it's something you have to work at to know how to you know, focus a, a band and also focus an audience. So um, very quickly, I kind of put my foot down and said, I'm the one who's going to do the talking. And, um, <laughs> and you know, thankfully, everybody shut up. <laughs> Incidentally, my favorite things on YouTube are the 90 minutes stitched to together, uh, you know, your stage band. All shirt. right, people! <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, so you actually, you were studying, you studied like Steve Marriott, and uh, you, you put a lot of thought into that, what it, you would you know, say on we, stage. We all are inspired by people who come before us. I didn't create anything. I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, the, the result of all these other parts. I'm like the sum of all these people who I respected and uh, was inspired by. So um, Steve Marriott was, uh, Humble Pie was in a, uh, just an amazing band. And he really turned these theater shows that I saw into like evangelical events. He was a preacher. And um, that's what I wanted to do. And that's what I want to do still when, when we do shows. I want the person in the back row to know that I'm talking to them. Everybody at our shows counts, and I owe everybody my last drop of blood and sweat. So, and it's exhilarating. I'm, look, I, I'm thrilled to have the kind of following that we have, and it's a big responsibility. And to this day, you know, we'll go out on tour in June. Um, I designed a new stage that arguably is the best stage we've had. So it's, it's always about not only living up to the audiences, I don't want to call you the audience, my friends, my fans. Um, yeah. Not only you know, your expectations, but the cool thing about my position is that I'm not only in KISS, but I'm a huge fan of the band. So I want the band to be the band, continue to be the band that I hope and wish it, it, it would be. So. Um, In the book, you... This is uh, like, it's very serious, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I'll get to the girls. <laughs> Boy, he can talk in a quiet voice and put sentences together. You know. We'll get there. Yeah. Patience. Yeah. We have a lot of time. Okay. Uh, in the book, you talk about um, that shyness and how you, you would go on stage and be star child and just exude this confidence, yet you'd come off stage and you couldn't even function in the most basic social situations. You, you want to go to a party and you drive up oh, and you can't, you can't go, it's a restaurant actually, yeah. and you can't go inside, you, yeah. you play Madison Square Garden and you're sitting alone after the show in a deli in New York eating matzo yeah, ball going, soup. Nobody would believe. <laughs> I just said, good night, and had a great time. And look, what I was on stage wasn't an act, and it's not an act today. It's very much who I am. What was missing was a person when I left the stage. To this day, look, I know, I know guys in other bands who never want to go home because they have no home. I didn't want to be one of those people, and I was. You know, I, I came off stage at the Garden, Madison Square Garden, and, and literally found myself in a, in a deli going, nobody would believe that I'm here 
by myself. You know, we have three sold out nights or whatever. Um, so, you know, there, there, there's a, at least for me, there was the challenge to integrate my life, not to just have this, this great life on stage, but to have a great life off stage. And that took a whole lot more work. Well, the flip side of that was, which is another story you tell in the book, you saw a woman on the cover of Penthouse Magazine, you called up your manager and she was in your bathtub that day, basically. Uh, so. <laughs> The one thing I never want people to think was, is I was so lonely. You know, don't, I don't want anybody to feel sorry for me. Bad, was it, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bad. You know, those those moments weren't deep in every sense, but you know, um, yeah, it was it was a great time to. I could go shopping through any magazine and just go send that one over. I'll take that. I'll, I'll, take, I'll take that. They come over the house and I look for the staple in the stomach. From the... Did, Jean uh, claims to have had 4,600 plus. Did you keep track of your... Uh... Yeah, but those weren't all humans. <laughs> A couple of cattle, you know. There's livestock in there, let me tell you. Oh. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> so, kiss. <laughs> kiss performed here in uh, 1977 at the Cow Palace. The night. Oh. <laughs> They, they were there. <laughs> uh, the night Elvis Presley died. Do you remember that? Yeah, show? at the Cow Palace, we like? dedicated um, Rock and Roll All Night to, to Elvis Presley. And um, yeah, we, we used to have some great times here. Um, we would stay at the Miyako. Yeah. And um, we had some very, very good times. <laughs> I, I, in your first appearance here in 1975, there was a review in the Chronicle, not written by me, obviously. And it said, <laughs> the ludicrous hard rock band, hard, hard rock quartet that appeared Friday at Winterland made them maybe the most crass, worthless rock band to run through town in years. The entire performance was silly, but not funny, and barely worth dignifying by comment. <laughs> Does it, did things like that bother you, or were thi Whoa, man. <laughs> <laughs> Dig the Jefferson Airplane, man. <laughs> That's real music. I never wanted to look like, you know, a musician who just got out of bed alone and walked onto the stage. <laughs> so, most of those critics are long gone, you know. Um, and, I mean, truthfully, when people are that vehement and vocal about disliking something, it's got way more to do with them and their issues than mine, you know? So, um, did it bother me? No, no. Um, I always knew what we were doing. I was always proud of it. Um, I had a plan, and those were like, those weren't even obstacles. Those were like mosquitoes. Those were just like pests, you know? Um, if you believe in what you're doing, you don't listen to the people who tell you it's no good. Right. So that brings us to the Rock and Roll Hall of <laughs> Fame. Um, after, <laughs> after 15, was it 15 years, 14 years? Uh, yes. They, they decided, okay, well, we've run out of bands, let's let Kiss in now. Yeah. <laughs> that's about, that's, that's um, not far off. Why, why did you accept? You could have turned them down. Because, because, because our fans, a lot of them see that as a um, validation of their belief in us and their fighting for us. And um, for that reason, I was there to, to get the award. Those slimy weasels. Um, 
you know, when somebody doesn't invite you to a party for 15 years, it's pretty clear they don't want you at the party. And um, um, the more people know about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the less they give it any credence. Um, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is not the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame of the people. That's why whenever there's an induction each year, most people scratch their heads about half the people who are being inducted. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is Jan Wenner from Rolling Stone magazine, who hasn't bought a ticket or bought an album in decades. Um, John Landau, uh, uh, Springsteen's manager. You know, I, you know, Bruce is phenomenal, but I think that the three or four people who are the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, these are guys who trademarked a name. You could have been the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame if you had trademarked it. So these guys decide who they want in their little club, and uh, we clearly, look, I'm as proud of the people who hate me as the people who like me, you know. And, and I couldn't pick a better bunch of weasels to hate me than those people. I mean, even when we um, were accepting the, the uh, induction and we went to uh, the Barclay Center in Brooklyn, we showed up there, there were no passes for us. Hmm. We're standing in the hall, we can't go into any rooms. They didn't tell us the running order. We had no idea when we were gonna go on. Um, we didn't even know how to get on the stage. Um, everybody else is giving acceptance speeches, and I'm going, wow, they're doing really great. And I look, and there's a teleprompter that they're all reading off. They didn't tell us that we could use a teleprompter. They were, um, they're weasels, you know, and, and um, the people who don't pay for tickets and don't pay for albums should not be the people who decide what is or isn't in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah. I mean, as, as far as, as far as I'm concerned, you put us in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame 40 years ago. Yeah. And, and as everyone knows, they, they only wanted to let the original form they wanted, not... Yeah, they, they, they were... <clears throat> it was interesting to me because they w were very insistent on it just being the original four. And to me, that was... I, the only way I could rationalize it is we're a bitter follow. When I said to them, one of the, the later members, mind you, but people who played on multi-platinum albums played to millions of people. Um, I, that's... Yeah. Spell their names. Um, so... I said, what about those guys? They went, it's a non-starter. What do you mean it's a non-starter? You're a pencil pusher, and I'm a guitar player. I'm the one who's, who's being nominated for induction. So um, I was really offended by the fact that I was told, well, we're not going to discuss that. So as far as I was concerned, we were there to celebrate the entire history of the band. If they wanted to minimize it and, and, and make it the original four, that's fine. I, I don't play by anybody else's rules except mine. Yeah. So, tell us a little bit about that night. Were, do you regret not performing? No, or? God. No. I was, you know, I'm, I mean, look, they wanted us to perform, you know, as some sort of like, First of all, they hate us, so the fact that I would do anything for them is ridiculous. But they wanted the original band in makeup, and um, I didn't want to do it because, look, the original two guys, and I was there, so whatever everybody else thinks they know, you know, is, is just a matter of what you've heard. But um, they wanted the original guys, those guys, both quit the band or were thrown out of the band once, twice, um, and to risk putting them on stage in makeup, and you have, you have to remember, we're not like other bands. You don't go up on stage in jeans or something and go, oh, that's the old guy, or, oh, that, that's the newer member. If there's four guys on stage in makeup, you're gonna say that's Kiss. And if the band happens to suck by chance, I'm the one who bears the brunt of it because I never left the band. I've been there 40 years every day. And I wasn't... And I wasn't... 
And I wasn't going to roll the dice on behalf of an organization that I think is a sham and two guys who honestly don't deserve to wear those outfits anymore. Um, they, we couldn't have accomplished what we've accomplished without them in the beginning. But um, they don't belong in it now, and I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to relive the past when, they're, when I'm jeopardizing the present. Did you talk to them that night? What, Absolutely. What was, the, what was it like? I spoke to them um, weeks before. I spoke to <clears throat> Peter again about a week before and said, look, we have differences, and we're always going to have differences. We're never going to agree on most things anymore. But let's enjoy this moment. Let's enjoy what we created together and forget about every, everything else. So, you know, it was, it was, it was a moment to see them, and uh, it was interesting, but... Um, and hopefully they had not read the book before they saw you. <laughs> um, I'm not sure each one of them can read a book. <laughs> I know them, you don't. <laughs> you know, it's always, I understand, but it's always interesting when I hear people having these opinions, pro or con, and I have to go, hey, you weren't there, you know? <laughs> you don't know what it was like. Um, you know? We still love all of you. I'm sorry? <laughs> Were, were, you, were you worried about um, hurting anyone's feelings with the things you wrote in the book? Were you thinking about other people at I the didn't time? write anything to be vindictive. Mm -hmm. I didn't write anything to be mean-spirited, but I wrote the truth. And did it hurt my dad? Absolutely. But what's the point in writing something unless you're truthful? I was truthful about myself. How could I not be truthful about everybody else? You know, um, the reason, the, one of the reasons the book is doing so well is because the truth sounds like the truth because it's the truth. When you read something and it sounds like the truth, chances are it's, it's true. You know, um, so look, I didn't, I, you know, if anybody, nobody got thrown under the bus. A couple of people walked under the bus, but, but I didn't throw them. I, I'm curious about your uh, relationship with uh, Gene after 40 years. I guess in the first, when you introduce him, you describe him as a character, like a character from Hee Haw. He's like in <laughs> overalls and uh, yeah. I think he had a beard. Uh, but anyway, so 40 years later, Again, he's written about prominently in this book, and you guys live down the street from each other. What, what is that? People are curious what that relationship is like, because it seems like it hasn't always been so... He's similar. like a cuddly porcupine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, look, you know, Gene is, is, is a really unique person, and um, he's my brother, and I've been furious at him at times and not spoken to him for long periods of time. Um, but it's 44 years we've been together and we've always had a, a strong work ethic and um, I think most of the time his heart's been in the right place. Um, so, look, he, he's, um, he enjoys rubbing people the wrong way. He, you know, you didn't notice. Um, you know, he... Gene loves to say things that are sound bites that are either abrasive or annoying. That's, you know, I, I don't deal with that. Um, we don't have that kind of relationship. And um, who you see and who he is when he's uh, in front of a crowd like this is not really the, the Gene who, who I know. We go back, you know, to a time we lived with our parents. So, um, we know each other very well, and he certainly doesn't do what I call the gene show for me. <laughs> you know. 
So you would, are you saying you would never go on a reality show? <laughs> Is that not you? Well, you, there's two things everybody should know. You can either have reality or you can have television, but there's no such thing as reality television. You know? um, if, if, somebody was, if somebody brought a camera into your house and documented every day, most of those shows would be really boring. So, you know, they, there's not a lot of, there's a, not necessarily um, a, a realistic picture of reality when you're doing television. And I would never do it because I want to live a, a real life. If you're busy in front of a camera, at least to my way of thinking, you're not really living a real life. You're not living, you're pretending. Life's too short you know, for that for me. Yeah. Well, it's great to see that you guys, despite all your differences and the times you made each other angry, it's great to see that you can still go back on a tour together and kind of tolerate each other at least for that 90 minutes on stage. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> I, I have to say, truthfully, we've never gotten along better. If, if you realize that we started out, let's see, I was 17 and he was 41, I think. <laughs> um, if you realize that we started out, you know, as, as I, I, w I think I was 17 and he was 19 or 20, but we've made possible with our, our, our fans and, and the people who've stuck by us, we've made a life for each other. Clearly very, very different lives. He would slit his wrists if he lived my life. And if I lived his, I'd slit his and mine. <laughs> but we, you know, but we, we, we have something very special. We have something very special. It's great. It's turning into the comedy store. <laughs> I told you it would get, yeah. it would get better. Uh, what was your favorite time to be a member of KISS? Was there, uh, was there a certain era that you look back fondly on that everything really came together? <clears throat> this can sound really corny. There's never been a better time than now. Right now. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. 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 Because, because KISS shouldn't be my life. KISS should only be part of my life, and that's what I have now. Um, you know, from here, I'll, I'll, I'll fly back home this evening, you know, so I can get up with my kids, and you know, in the morning. So, um, you know. sooner, sooner or later, if we're lucky, we realize that life is really about family, your children, your family, and your friends. Without that, the rest is, is hollow. You can build something really great if that's at the center. Thank you. So let me ask you, how many times did you legitimately think KISS was over and done and that you were, when you walked off that tour bus that that was the last time you were doing it? Never, because... Even after the farewell tour? <laughs> you know, well, you know, the interesting, interesting thing about the farewell tour and, you know, hand, you know, hand of God, I really thought that it was over, but the farewell tour was because Ace and Peter were so friggin' unbearable that we just decided we had to end the band. And then later on, I was at a car wash and I accepted that the band was over. And a guy at this car wash said to me, I saw the farewell tour and it was so great. When's the 35th anniversary tour? And I went, it was like, you don't want us gone? And, and suddenly it dawned on me that the farewell tour Maybe it was just farewell to, to the guys. We've never subscribed to the idea that we follow what we do based upon one or two guys. If you want to take your guitar or your drums and go home, that's okay. But I, I love what I do. And as far as I'm concerned, Kiss is my band. And I'd like everybody in the band to feel that it's their band. But I know in my heart that if things go south and people aren't holding up their end, I'll hold up their end for them because I love the band. I feel like, you ever see that show, Inside the Actor's Studio? <laughs> yes, and then my third film. <laughs> and your third film. Yes. <laughs> Let me ask you about films. Lawrence, yeah. 
Laurence Olivier once said that... Um, no, Kiss, Kiss was such a visual band. Yes. Why did you leave things with Kiss Meets the Phantom of the... That was... That was you know, <laughs> when you do something of that caliber... <laughs> Where, where can you go? After that, what's left to do? I still don't understand the end of that movie. I don't understand how you made your voice do that in that movie. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, that, that, that film was... You couldn't, you couldn't follow it up, even if you tried. No, There's no I mean, way. That, that's as good as it gets. Yes. I'm going to watch it tonight after this. <laughs> um, how did, in your mind, how did KISS change the music industry? What, what, what's, what was the band's greatest contribution? I think, I think, um, I think we, were, we have been a wake-up call to audiences that they don't have to accept apathy or disrespect from the people on stage that the people on stage owe you everything. And um, they're not doing you a favor by being on stage. You're doing them a favor by showing up. And um, when you come to a concert, you deserve to see something great. And um, it just, you know, it, the proof is that everybody from country acts to rap acts have KISS DNA in their shows now because people don't, ex people don't accept less at this point. So I think that that's a, a great thing, is that um, when young people go and see KISS as their first band, the next band they go to see, they go, where's the fire? Where's... When's, when's that guy going to fly through the air? You know? Um, you know how come they're not wearing tights in eight-inch heels? You know? <clears throat> it, that's a thing I remember... Uh, I was quite terrified of Kiss when I was a kid because you guys, I thought you were evil. I mean, uh, <laughs> what, what, but you, the funny thing is that thought never crossed your mind that people might think of you as a... As a I never, I, I, I always saw us as very high energy, you know, really like a, a adrenaline, just like a, a, a band self-possessed. And I think for people who were sitting at home and perhaps had very um, sedentary, stationary lives. To see somebody up there jumping around like that, you, you might go, that's got to be the devil's work, you know? But, um, you know, the, the, I was always astounded when people would say, well, it stands for Knights and Satan's Service, or, you know, um, which part of the show do you step on the chickens, you know? Um, you know I always say, you know, the person pointing the finger at you is the one who you have to watch, you know, that's the person who you should be most suspect of, the one who accuses everybody else. You know, it's always interesting that um, whenever a, an evangelical preacher is tempted by the devil or tested, it's in a cheap motel with a hooker, you know, so. But those are the people who are pointing the fingers at us, so. <laughs> And that's the remarkable thing, is you guys stayed clean throughout, throughout it all. Um, like, even though you were on Casablanca Records, you, you were going to Studio 54, but you were actually going to dance. You were one of the few people who was there to dance. <laughs> and ultimately do a horizontal dance. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, look, I, even back... <laughs> do you get it? What, um, what's this horizontal dance? <laughs> what do they call it? The horizontal mambo? What is it? Um, you know, even when, when there were, I mean, the, the amount of drugs that were around the band um, at the early part was just crazy. I mean, everybody was just giving us stuff all the time, and you know, the, the idea was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I said, you keep the drugs. I just want the rest, you know? So, and look, I mean, the fact is, that I'm here today, and you're not here interviewing Jimi Hendrix or Jim Morrison or Janis Joplin or Philip Seymour Hoffman or Belushi, you know, drugs or drugs kill. Whether they kill, they either kill your spirit or they kill your 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 soul. So um, I 
I've never understood the attraction to drugs. And if some people are um, addictive personalities and, and people who have a, a, are predisposed to that, before you start, go get help. You know, it's, it's, it's a terrible thing to start and then try to stop. Much better when we look at ourselves and go, I've got some issues and take care of them before they take care of you. I feel so grown up. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> yeah. uh, what's your favorite Kiss album? Which one would you put on if you... Uh, if you... <laughs> think, think of a better one. <laughs> think of a better one. Yes. <laughs> um, I think that the album that really captures what this band has always been about... <laughs> Is your name Paul Stanley? He's talking to me. <laughs> Um, um, I think Kiss Alive. I just... I think we've always been, we've always been a live band. We've always been a band that um, brings it. So, um, Destroyer's a great album. Uh, and there, you know, the rest is a matter of taste, but um, I think Alive really captured the essence of what the band is. It's a, it's a live, breathing animal. It's a juggernaut. Um, it's like being you know, at the end of the world. It's like rock and roll Armageddon. <laughs> yeah. do, do you feel bad that it's so expensive to be a KISS fan? Because you can't just go buy the record. You have to buy the belt buckle. You have to buy the Hello Kitty mints. You have to buy the... <laughs> I know you, you, you might know this, but... You, nobody comes to your house with a gun and says you have to buy anything. You know, um, you know truth be told, the reason those things are all successful is because people tell us that they want them. Um, there's no genius... Um, there's no genius um, who's, you know, coming up with these great ideas. The fans tell us what they want, and then it's still up to them whether or not they, they want it. Look, there's, there's people who love the band for what the band is, and there's other people who want uh, you know, some of the paraphernalia. And, and I'm glad and proud that we're a band that has that broad a scope that we appeal on so many different levels. You know, there, there's a reason that um, you know, nobody has a Fleetwood Mac doll. But, <laughs> and, and, and I love... I love Fleetwood Mac, and I love Stevie, and I love, you know, I love all of them. But I, you know, that was just an example off the top of my head, but we're, but, you know. I, I would take a Stevie Nicks doll, by the way. <laughs> and preferably one that blows up. <laughs> that works, yeah. Um, but it, I, I think my point is really that we don't, we're not defined, and we don't want what rock and roll is defined by other bands. We define what we are, and we live by it. Um, I'm not, not ashamed of any, any aspect of what we've done, because at the end of the day, when I go on stage, I go, this band kills. And, um, you know, I, I've had people who I respect immensely, and people who inspired me come to shows and go, this is a great band. And uh, so it, it's never been um, about sizzle without a steak. Um, we couldn't be doing this 40 years as successful as we've been unless there was something far beyond the makeup. Um, if it was just a matter of you know, a bunch of guys wearing makeup, then um, we'd be some other band. <laughs> I already put my foot in my mouth with Fleetwood Mac, so I'm, I'm... That's a great idea, though. You should make those. Um, is there... Is there a... he, he wants the Stevie Nicks blow-up doll. And maybe the Mick Fleetwood one. He's kind of cool. Yeah. 
And what, who am I to judge? <laughs> what, what song will you never This get? is the city of brotherly love. There right? you go, yeah. <laughs> so your brother's Mick Fleetwood. <laughs> what, what song will you never get tired of playing? I'm sorry? What song will you never get tired of playing? Um, Detroit Rock City, Love Gun. Um, rock and Roll All Night, Shout It Out Loud, God of Thunder, Firehouse, um, Got to Choose. I'm... Strutter, Love, you know... Heaven's on Fire. Heaven's on Fire. Black Diamond. Hold I, I, I asked him what song he'll never get tired of playing. <laughs> so quite a few, yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> proud of all the songs. Um, I'm certainly proud of all the songs I've written. <laughs> you know. How did uh, things change for you once you took the makeup off? Because you went, um, you know, you had this mask on for all those years where it helped you become this confident person mm. who could go on stage and do all these things. And then the 80s come around and you guys take the masks off, mm. you have new players in the band. What? Yeah, I, um, it didn't change anything for me because what I've always done is me and it comes from inside me. Um, so, thank you. So when, when the makeup came off, I was still out there doing what I do. So it didn't change anything. I just thought it was imperative that we take the makeup off because I think we made some mistakes along the way. And uh, of course, everybody's entitled to their own opinions. But um, I think once we started bringing in new members and new characters, it lost a certain, um, I don't know whether I could say it was disingenuous. It reached a point where, you know, we had the fox, we had the Egyptian warrior, we could have had Turtle Man. You know, <laughs> you know it was just, it, it, it lost something. And um, I think that we, we kind of polluted the water. And uh, at that point, I think that people were tired of what the band looked like. They were listening with their eyes. And when an album like Creatures of the Night came out, which was a really good album, and was met... Yeah. Yeah. And was met with pretty much apathy, um, I thought, well, I wanted to take it off for that one, but I, I went, we really need to do this. And of course, uh, we took it off, and Lick It Up sold five times what, what Creatures sold. So. Um, if we couldn't be a great band without the makeup, then we didn't deserve to be a band at all. So it was really trial by fire as far as I was concerned. And uh, there's no way to compete with the, the KISS imagery and, and what those four iconic figures are. So to take the makeup off, sure, makes us much more generic and very much like a lot of other bands who were around at, the, at that time. But um, it was necessary, it was, it was something we had to do, we had to give something up in order to, to continue. And then what made you decide to put it back on when you, in, in the 90s? I, um, I suddenly started thinking about the mortality of the people in the band and started to think, um, I didn't know quite honestly how long some, some of the guys in the band might last. And um, I hate the word closure because that got so overused but I, I just began thinking, what if maybe we, you know, and I had sworn I would never do it. Maybe we can regroup. Maybe um, everybody can learn from the past. Uh, maybe, you know, people can uh, see the gift that this band is and we can move forward. So we, we did the uh, Unplugged, which was, uh, MTV Unplugged was really an outgrowth of us doing a KISS convention tour where we played acoustically. So for the Unplugged, um, what had happened just prior to that is we were doing a, a convention in, in LA and Eric said, why don't we invite Peter down? 
So Peter came down, and it was, you know, it was fun. I hadn't seen him in, I don't even know how long. It was probably um, 16 years or something like that. And um, we thought maybe, maybe we, we can do this. And it was not an easy, easy uh, um, time to get Ace and Peter uh, in agreement, you know, to do this. And, and once they agreed, there was a lot of, um, wrestling and, and trying to get everybody in shape because the last thing we wanted to do, at least the last thing I wanted to do, was shatter somebody's memory by going out there, you know, a bunch of fat guys in leotards, you know. Like, you know so, you know, we hired trainers and, and uh, had very strict um, contracts to make sure that people would, would not abuse themselves or abuse the fans by um, substances being put in their body. It's futile. You, you can't really get anybody to stop anything. But um, so it just seemed like maybe we can get back together, wiser, older, and move forward. Maybe I thought maybe we can do this to the end. Maybe we can get back together and see this through the end and pick up where we left off. Um, that was not the case. It just, it, it very quickly disintegrated. And um, instead of, I mean, you know, in, in Peter's case, Peter um, said, I am so lucky to be back. I mean, these two guys were broke at that point, which is something to put in Ripley's Believe It or Not, because how you can be broke after you, you know, you were in Kiss is, is hard to believe. But... <laughs> You know, they came back, and Peter said, I'll never do that again. I, I'm so thankful to be back. And it wasn't too long after that the same stuff started happening. And instead of being thankful for what they had, they were more envious of what I had. And that's unfortunate. There's people with more than me. I'm happy with what I have. And you have to remember, too, once again, I never left the band. So are you going to come back and be an equal? Absolutely not. But be thankful that you're back at all. Yeah. And I, again, you know, I hoped, I hoped that we would be able to um, really create something. And uh, it just wasn't, wasn't to be. Um, and that, my friends, is life. <laughs> You know? We're going to take questions from them in a minute, but I wanted to ask you one more thing. In the, you end the book by kind of insinuating that KISS can continue without you. Is that, do you actually see that happening? Sure. Um, you know, if you go to a... <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> I, I, think, I think I'm really, really good at what I do, but I'm not crazy enough to think that I'm the only person who who can do this, doesn't mean you have to copy me any more than I copied the people who inspired me. There's, there's people out there who have incredible talent. Um, does anybody, you know, I, we're not a rock band like other rock bands. We're, we're a way of life. We're a way of dealing with a, a, a stage. We're, um, we're a lifestyle. We're, we're about preaching self-empowerment, celebrating life putting on a great rock show. I mean, does anybody go to the Yankee games and, and hold up signs, where's Babe Ruth? I mean, it's just, you know. You know. So I, I liken us much more in the best ways to a team or an army. But we're, we're still, make no mistakes, we're a rock band. But the people who thought that it could only be the original members, and I was one of those people. Well, those people are 50% wrong now. You know, on the, on the last tour, uh, you know, we, we showed every night from the, the, the shows on KISS Online, 10,000, up to 110,000 people coming to the shows. So I would like to see this go on after I can't go on anymore because people deserve it, whether I'm there or not. Okay, so now we're going to take some questions from the audience. <laughs>
Just put your hand up and Andy and I will get you. Hold on, hold on, wait for the mic to get to you, please. Hi, Paul, welcome to the JCC. You and the band mm. have been big uh, advocates for con giving back to the community, from the walk and rock you did in Sacramento to the Wounded Warriors support. Does that have a spart part of a special meaning to you to give back to the community? You know, sometimes things can sound so cliche, but the truth is, the more you give, the more you get. You, you, you feel better about yourself when you help other people. Um, giving really is its, its own reward. And in the case of um, soldiers and uh, Wounded Warrior Care Project, on this tour too, we'll be giving a dollar from every ticket. You've got people who volunteer to risk their lives, risk their limbs, to give us the security and to give us the liberty and freedom that we enjoy. So when those people come back, we owe them everything. So if there's some way that we can focus a spotlight on them, it, honest to God, it makes me feel good. To, you make the world better by helping other people. Our next question over here on your guys' right. Thank you. My question is in regards to uh, live music. Um, are there artists that you're seeing coming up today that bring a production value that you think is uh, inspiring for the new generation? I think, I think um, live concerts have reached a point where the state of the art is terrific. What's missing is music. Um, you know, it's unfortunate that um, because somebody has a, a hit album that they did in their living room and has never played for people, that those people have to go out and try to entertain. The reason a band like us still thrives is because we've learned our craft. And uh, when you've got machine-made music with vocalists that are auto-tuned, it's just, I think people miss out on the incredible power that music can have when it's made by human beings. The next question's right here in the front. Hi, Paul. Um, Hi. Uh, you're an amazing songwriter, and from a, a songwriting standpoint, I always wanted to, I was always curious to know, do many of the songs that you've written come to you in just a, a complete, or are they ones that you really, really have to, you get a riff and really have to work to get them to the end, or are they this comprehensive, the song just comes to you? The only song that ever came to me almost in total was Love Gun. And that I pretty much wrote on an airplane without a guitar. I just knew, knew the, the whole song. But um, most of the time it starts with a guitar, a guitar figure. I'll just sit and play until something interesting comes out and then build on that and then start singing. And the singing will, will become the framework and I'll sing a few words here and there and then it becomes kind of like filling in the blanks. Some of it comes organically. So it's almost like stream of consciousness and start singing and then grab bits and pieces of that and fill in, fill in the blanks. Our next question over here on your guys' right. Hey, Paul, thank you for uh, everything that you've done. <clears throat> well, my you. question is, the book that came out, Nothing to Lose, are you gonna be coming out with any other books such as that with the different time errors? Um, Sure, it's a great idea. I thought that the great thing about Nothing to Lose was it was the recollections of the people around us. And uh, so it's, it's pretty accurate. I found it fascinating when I read the book because um, maybe I was sheltered from a lot of what was going on. It was interesting back then because Bill O'Coin, who was as important to the band as anybody in the band, really sheltered us in a way uh, anybody who worked for us was told what they could tell us, what they couldn't tell us, what we liked to hear, what, you know, it, we were really uh, pampered in a way that we were insulated from the world. So interesting to, to read that book and, and uh, hear people's memories, some that were all new to me. The next question's right here in the front. Hi, Paul. Um, you'd mentioned about, you know, keeping the band going. Future generations, so do you look at like Evan and like Nick Simmons continuing on, or do you do a franchise, uh, official Kiss franchises, or? Well, you, th this isn't McDonald's, you know. <laughs> um, I, I, I would never wish for anybody's child to take their place, 
you know, I, the, the worst thing in the world would be to have to be Frank Sinatra Jr. <laughs> you know, I mean, to, to walk in your, your parents' shadow. I, I don't want that for Evan. I want Evan to um, find his passion, which I think he has, and to follow that. But um, to try to be Dad Jr., it, it doesn't appeal to me, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't want that for him. So, um, but I do believe that there's great, great talent out there that could blow you away and blow me away. You know, you, you, there are people out there who deserve to be heard. And our next question, back over here on the right. Hey, Paul, how are you doing? Good to have you here tonight. Good to be had. Hey. <laughs> um, Eddie Trunk, who's the, the host of the, That Metal Show, been a big fan of... Uh, see, yeah. Uh, will you ever show up on the show? Will you ever go there? For... Come on. What's going on, Paul? Honestly, honestly, that, that's, I guess, an acquired taste for some. And to me, it's... It's Wayne's World. Um, <laughs> and, uh, the only thing missing from the, the bits I saw years ago was Party on Wayne or Party on Car. Um, I, I, I really, I don't think, um, no, I, I, the less said the better, but no, I, I can't, I, I can't imagine being a part of that. The next question's right here in the middle. Hi, Paul. Thanks for coming to San Francisco and hanging out with thank us. You, thank tonight. you, thank you, thank um, you. Paul, is it true that you didn't invite Gene to your first wedding? Um, he was at my first wedding. Maybe that's what was wrong, because he wasn't at my second. <laughs> um, my, you know, I have no, I think that everybody's entitled to their opinions, um, and we should respect each other's opinions. What becomes the problem is when somebody um, insults you for your opinion. Um, Gene was very vocal and, and very uh, derogatory in, in, in his words about marriage and about the people who got married. And honestly, I'm close enough to him that I said, you don't belong at my wedding. You know, um, I happen to value the idea of marriage and you know, the, the sanctity of it. And to have somebody there who berates not only the the institution of marriage, but the people who get married, you, it would have been, it would have been, um, I would have been false to myself. And that's the worst thing we can do. The best thing we can do in our lives is, is be honest with people and, and not, not do favors that impact badly on us. Our next question over here to your right again. Hey Paul, I'm Aaron. Question is, what role has Judaism played in your life? Well, I think I grew up in a, in a household where most of my parents' friends had numbers on their arms. And from the time I was little, I was always aware of the Holocaust, and I was always aware that I was Jewish. And although we didn't, we didn't practice as much as many other people, to this day, I'm proud to be Jewish. I think it's my obligation to all the people who for centuries have been persecuted. Uh, it's my obligation to make sure that their story is told, that my children know it, and uh, that it never gets minimized or distorted. So. I think, you know, I think all religions are great until they claim to be better than another or judge a another religion. You know, spirituality and, and, and a love of God in its purest form is terrific. Religion can often get in the way of that spirituality and the purity of it. But that being said, you know, you can ask me, and without any hesitation, I'm Jewish. Next question's right here in the middle. Hi, Mr. Stanley. Are you gonna ever make- Did you call make... me Mr. Stanley? <laughs> yes. Am I your teacher? <laughs> yeah. Call me Paul. Call me Are Paul. Are you gonna ever make any 
solos, like any other solo albums? I'd like to. If I did another solo album, it would be much more like my first one. Um, yeah. my, second, my second solo album was really kind of like um, a project for me to, to get away from doing what I do in KISS because some of the KISS albums have basically been almost solo albums. So um, Live to Win was really me trying to push the boundaries, but if I was to do another one, and I, I certainly plan on it, it will be a, a guitar through a Marshall amplifier. Our next question here in the center. Hi, Mr. Stanley. Oh, please. <laughs> You educated me a little bit. I had a question about, before the makeup came off, did you have any funny stories about people recognizing you or not recognizing you? Before the makeup came off? Yeah, like you're out and about and someone knows who you are. No, I, I don't remember that, but I remember, I remember one... Let me think how this happened. Um, Some guy came over to me in the 70s and said that his girlfriend wound up going to bed with some guy who said he was me. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and I said, I hope he was good. <laughs> Next question, also here in the center. Hi, Paul. I'm Jonathan. Hi. Uh, technical question about your guitar. The brown fiber that you used, that you had painted black by your father, you touched yes. on a little bit in the book. But the cover of Alive was shot at Michigan Palace. Yes. And you used it. But your main guitar during that time was the V. So I just wonder how it came about. You used the fiber on the photo and not the V, since it was your normal guitar you were playing on that tour. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> You've been waiting all night, and look at the answer you get. <laughs> All right, all right. I don't know. And our next question right here in the center. Hi, my name is Tammy. Hi. I'd like to say thank you, because when my family was homeless and my children were younger, they didn't have friends, but they had Kiss. Oh. And my... <laughs> my son is looked at differently because he doesn't dress like what they can, sh what people, society thinks a straight boy should look like. Stand up. He, I told him it looks like your closet. May he say something to you? Hi, I'm Brandon. I just want to say that I love you very much. You've been a really Thank big you. inspiration in my life. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just say, let me just say, you know, to Brandon and, and other people too, you know, being different is a great thing. But don't do something that makes life too difficult for yourself. You know, I mean, you, we only get one trip here. So um, be good to yourself. And, you know, don't put yourself in a position where other people can be mean or bad to you. You know, you have a choice to make it a little easier for yourself. And I don't want to see you in pain. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you, Paul Stanley. Thank you, Idine Vazari. Thank you. Thank you.